I've actually I've actually gamified uh, a course that uh, that was American Studies based on the Star Trek universe and how it exports American culture around the world. It's a great series and a great way to talk about culture. Exactly. All right, everyone, let's get this started. Um, my name's Addie Kirkham, and I'm an undergraduate research assistant here for the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence. And we have um, today presenting Mehmet Sawyer, Travis Thurston, Samantha Clem, and Rachel Tom. And I'll just turn the time over to them so they can introduce themselves and get going. Perfect, thank you, Addie. Um, so as we get started, we'll just take a minute and introduce ourselves. I'm Travis Thurston. I'm the Assistant Director uh, in the Office of Empowering Teaching Excellence here at Utah State University. Sam? Uh, my name's... Oh. Go ahead, Mehmet. Sorry. Uh, my name is Mehmet Sawyer, and I'm an assistant professor in sociology, and my area of interest is environmental sociology and with an interest in social inequality. And I'm, my name is Sam Clem, she, they, and I am a second year PhD student in technical communication and also the diversity and inclusion specialist at ETE. Perfect. Um, Sam, can you go ahead and share your screen and share the slides? And as she's pulling that up, uh, the first question that I just want to throw out to everyone is why, why do we use online discussions? Why do you use online discussions in your courses? Can I get a quick thumbs up? Are you all seeing the right screen? Okay. So Travis, did you want us to talk about that? Or is that a rhetorical question or did you want us to use that in chat? Good, I'll provide some extra instructions. Thanks. So you can drop a comment in chat. You can unmute and share your, your thoughts. Either way is fine. Okay, cool. So one of the reasons that I use the online discussions is, well, twofold. Number one, um, to really have the students share their thoughts and do a little bit of um, you know, collaborative learning based on the information that they're reading and studying. And it's also to help build a little bit of sense of community and team among the students. So a little bit of academic and social. Travis, this is Carla. Um, I also use them to allow them to reflect on the content, but what I really like is incorporating the peer review aspect. So I always have them respond to each other's posts, which I find it creates that community and, and good collaboration. And it also, I think, makes them a little more careful as to what they post because they know their peers are evaluating it as well. Yeah, I like that. So, so far I'm hearing um, some ideas on, on collaboration, getting students working together, some ideas on community, building, building a space where students are communicating with other students and we can communicate with them. Other thoughts? Why why do we use online discussions? I like to I like to use them also for the same purposes for community and for dialogue. Also, I like it that it gets them somewhat more attuned to communicating with an audience. I teach uh, writing courses, so I like the fact that um, the dial the dialogue that does happen in an online discussion board it does promote that ongoing discussion where you're writing with the intent of really trying to you know present your ideas with clarity. So it does help you to kind of become more conscious of uh, audience. Good, I like that. Um, being conscious of audience, that's a good point. I like that. Um, Anton, I noticed here in the chat is saying to try and promote student interaction and reflect on important concepts. Karen saying she uses them to engage students um, with one another. So getting those students to work together. And Elizabeth is saying, I want I want the discussions to help create a learning community between the students and around content. And she points out a good thing here at the end. Unfortunately, too often I find that it becomes a public assignment post, less interaction than I'd hoped for. 
although they post to each other, I don't think they go back to read those comments. That's a good, that's a great point, actually, Elizabeth, because I, I think a lot of us who have used online discussions have run into that same issue. Um, and so one of the things we want to do today is, is share a strategy that, that we've used, that we've approached, um, that can help mitigate some of the things we run into. So like Elizabeth pointed out, not getting the students really interacting, um, which is from what I'm hearing, one of the main things that we want our students to be doing in the online discussions. We also know from the literature on online discussions that uh, a lot of the time students are staying in these lower levels of blooms, right? So they're thinking about um, regurgitating information from readings or from assignments. And sometimes we don't get into that discourse or that, that back and forth and actually having some discussion. Um, and so we're going to talk about how we can address some of those issues um, with this strategy called digital power ups. So I originally learned about this from Brad Gustafson in his book, and he says our goal with digital power ups is to move students from basic responses to more in depth analysis by providing students with additional choice and voice. So we're gonna focus on those two things a lot as we talk about this is providing students with choice and voice. Um, and he says that as we do that, we're going to empower them to reach levels that were previously unimaginable. So to the, his point, from our perspective as the instructors, there's, there's two things that we're gonna focus on. There's this course design, how we're, how we're setting up the discussions, um, some of the, the the processes, the expectations that we set up uh, beforehand, and then also how we actually facilitate that with the students and how we get them to engage with each other. So the big question, what is a digital power up, right? So in, in my definition of a digital power up, it, it's combined with uh, three main things. So we're gonna use a hashtag on the front we're going to use a keyword um, in my implementation um, and what I've helped a lot of others that we usually use Bloom's taxonomy verbs that align with some of our learning objectives, but it doesn't have to be that. It's just a keyword. And then the third aspect is a prompt. And so with each of those keywords, we're also going to have an associated prompt that goes with it. Um, so rather than just asking maybe one question or asking students to respond to one idea, we're going to give them multiple prompts um, that they can choose from. And so these are the ones that, that we have used. These are, these are the power-ups um, that Brad Gustafson originally talks about in his book. Uh, and so you'll notice there are quite a few options here. And each one of them is going to have their own prompt. And so in our instructions to the students, uh, we provide an introduction to the topic, and then we give them, we ask them to choose two to three of the options or two to three of the power-ups to help guide their, their initial posts um, in their comment uh, in the, in the uh, online discussion. And so what that does is it gives them multiple entry points uh, into the conversation, which one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite articles is by Riggs and Linder uh, from 2016. And they talk about this concept of how we sometimes, uh, some of the limitations of discussions are because of the way that we set them up, right? So pause for a second and just picture yourself, you know, pre-pandemic without your mask on in front of a classroom full of students, um, we would, if we asked a question that we were trying to prompt discussion, we would not go through the class one by one and have each one of them stand up and respond to that same question, right? We, we wouldn't do that, right? That seems kind of silly. And further, we would not then go through and want each of them to comment on what their peers had just said in response to that one question, right? So Riggs and Leonard point that out as, um, when, we're, when we're designing our online discussions, we want to create them in a way that provides opportunities um, for, for different levels of engagement, for different entry points. And this is one of the things that we can do with digital power-ups. 
So this is an example. Uh, we have our three elements of the digital power up here. We have the hashtag, we have a Bloom's level verb, and then we have an associated prompt. So with this, with this power up, hashtag create, we'd be asking students to develop a novel response based on something that they read using text, video, or, or something else. Um, in my own research on digital power-ups, there were, there were two of the most, two of the most used power-ups were hashtag remember and hashtag create. So students really dug into this. Um, however, in other disciplines, um, our colleague, uh, Michelle Arnold, she's used this in her geography courses and she actually sees the most use of kind of those mid-level power-ups, like the analyze, evaluate in her classes on what students prefer. And so what's interesting with that is you can provide um, different opportunities for the students. You can encourage them to use different power-ups throughout. Um, and then we'll, I'll throw in a resource here at the end that gives you a, a list of all of them so you can start thinking about them. So from a course design perspective, again, going back to that instructor presence, we're thinking about course design and course facilitation. I wanted to show you just kind of a visual example of what that might look like. Um, we use Canvas here. So when I set it up in Canvas, I have, I have these four different areas within the discussion as I'm setting it up. I have kind of an introduction. Oh, phone's ringing. <laughs> I have kind of an introduction section that for me is uh, just talking about some of the readings and the content that we are, that we were discussing that week, um, or at least that we were reading that week. I'll also sometimes add some supplemental content right there inside of the discussion. So in this case, it's showing uh, like a sample video that would, uh, that I could add in there. And then I also usually add some things that I call ideas to ponder. And these aren't specific questions. I want them to answer in the discussion, these are prompts for them as they're, as they're reflecting on what they want to respond in the discussion. Um, and so I set that up in my expectations with the students so they know, I don't want you to answer these specifically. These are things for you to start thinking and processing through the content. And then at the bottom, I always provide the, the specific instructions that week, they might vary week to week. Um, and I also, you can't see it here very well, but I also have a tab where I list out all of the digital power-ups each week as kind of a reminder for where they're at. When the students actually make their post, um, again, this is from Canvas, you'll see a few things in there. Uh, you'll see that they start each of their paragraphs with that hashtag and the keyword, um, and then they go into their response. That's a cue to me as the instructor, but it's also a cue uh, to them and to their classmates as to the level that they're engaging. Um, for example, hashtag understand is that you ask a question for your, for your peers to respond to. So when they see hashtag understand, they're actually thinking about a question that they want to prompt their peers to respond to. And you'll, I guess the last thing on that one is we also, I also use the like and sort by like feature in Canvas. And that does something um, that the literature talks about in online discussions where sometimes the highest quality posts get buried in the threads. And so I've used that like and sort by like as kind of a, a way to allow the students to curate the threads themselves. So I instruct them to like the post that they think is the highest quality post that week. And then Canvas actually sorts that up to the top um, and then I usually give like a bonus point or something like that to the student that has the most likes each week. Okay, and then I just wanna hit on presence real fast. So thinking about the facilitation. So what we actually do uh, um, facilitating this digital power of strategy. For me, go ahead and go to the next one, Sam. For me, I like to think about this in terms of, of humanized learning. So this comes from Michelle Pekansky Brock, and she tells us not to be a robot, right? <laughs> be approachable, um, find ways to check in individually with your students. One of the ways that I did that uh, when I, or one of the ways that I do that is by using individualized messages. Um, there was a great 
gift session, one of the pre-recorded sessions, talking about using the message students who feature um, in Canvas. That's a great way that you can check in individually. Um, I taught a, a course using digital power-ups um, in, in Slack, in the Slack environment. Um, and so it looked a little bit different there, but I could send individual messages to my students. So Anton's asking in the chat, I don't use Twitter. They actually respond on Canvas discussion boards. That's, act, that's absolutely right. Yep, we respond. I had the students engaging in Canvas. However, I have also used this in a social media and specifically in Twitter. I've used this on Twitter before as well. Um, but uh, when I very first used it, I did use it just directly in Canvas. So that on your point, Anton. Um, and then the finally, like, especially during COVID, we, we need to be thinking about supporting our students through, through difficult times and, and being flexible in our approach. Sorry, I jumped a gun there, Sam. Go ahead and advance. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, after, after attending uh, Travis uh, presentation last year, uh, I had an enlight uh, enlightenment in my mind that I had an aha moment for, for my uh, discussion um, discussion board. Uh, uh, I have been teaching lots of, um, uh, you know, class about social inequality, social problems, theory. Those are including lots of uh, controversial topics as well. Uh, especially, we we live in predominantly white institution and also predominantly uh, 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 predominantly white ethnicity and also uh, Mormon institution. So, uh, and I apply this method to my social inequality course. And uh, the reason I apply this course is uh, first I want to challenge myself. <clears throat> and I wanna uh, uh, I wanna challenge the power dynamics in the classroom. So um, I'm a professor, okay, and uh, quote unquote, I have a, an authority to write the question, and I want them to answer my own questions, right? So I wanna challenge this approach, and I wanna give agency um, agency for my students to 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 have a a voice, right? To have a voice and choice, uh, as as Travis mentioned, choice and voice. I love that. So, and since students have freedom to choose their own hashtags, so that is definitely uh, create an ownerships, ownerships while reading the chapters, while watching the videos about the uh, about the content of that week. Students look at the uh, uh, look at the chapter from their own uh, interest, actually, um, and um, so and since there are lots of options, uh, six or seven options, I'm not sure right now, but uh, I'm gonna challenge that options as well in a minute after getting some feedback from my students, um, and students choose uh, and choose the uh, hashtags and give voice to those hashtags. So. This is really wonderful so far. And I have applied uh, around three or four classes of mine and, uh, and uh, I am recruiting my uh, colleagues and I already recruit my, um, my, uh, my spouse as well. So for this, uh, I love this approach. And this is less stressful, uh, especially during pandemic. Uh, and I got some feedback from my students as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, prompting your own questions, give some stress uh, to some of the students as well, um, uh, because you are uh, creating your own questions from your own power, from your own perceptions as well sometime. So <clears throat> it might be not that much inclusive. So, uh, so that is really important uh, as well. So another thing that I would like to share with you is <clears throat> I checked some controversial topics, uh, controversial um, uh, chapters in my, uh, in my classes, like race and ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and so forth. And <clears throat> I see that this approach creates an inclusive environment in the, in the classroom. And, and healthy environment, 
in healthy and inclusive environment. How? And I see that there are some patterns actually, and I didn't expect this pattern, but eventually I checked it and the, the pattern, the students, most of the time, they choose remember, understand and connect. And they share their own stories. They share their own um, uh, experience with different races, different sexualities, different genders. So when they when they use the connect hashtag, uh, since they are sharing their own experiences, uh, the other students relate uh, with those experiences as well. So and also understand. I love that as well. Students are trying to understand the chapter, and and they they get exposed by different uh, different ideas, right? And they challenge themselves. That's wonderful. And remember. They recall, they recall from their past experiences as well. I, I love this approach, especially for, um, uh, for uh, difficult uh, subject matters. And, and I'm gonna give some, some of the evidences uh, from my students' feedback, actually. After finishing, my, after finishing this semester, I, I, I told them, hey, give me a feedback about this, especially for, for this approach. And some of the, uh, some of the feedbacks are, are challenging me, uh, challenging my approach as well. Uh, I, I really love that. So one of them is the power-ups were, uh, were an amazing learning method. The thing I missed the most is interacting with my peers in class. And this was an amazing ways to substitute this. This is again, uh, remember, I remember Dr. Sawyer saying at the beginning of the semester that he wanted us to learn things in this class, not memorize them. And I think the power ups helped with that. They allowed us to analyze what we read and share it with our classmates instead of just reading to take a quiz or exam. So in my classes, there's no quiz or exams. So I quiz and exam free uh, my uh, classes. So I really like this approach as well. Analyze, especially uh, Travis mentioned that the COVID pandemic going on, we weren't able to have in person discussions, but these discussion boards made us able to do some. It, we are not robots, right? We are human beings and we, we wanna interact. We wanna interact each other. So that is wonderful. And another thing, this isn't something I used before in the class. Yeah, this is not this is not the method I used to use in my class either. Uh, but I think other classes should adopt it when using discussions as as assignments. So this is the part of the recruitment process as well. So we are trying to recruit more and more professors for this approach. So last thing, this is I I really like this. This is not just one student, but I see three two or three. I, I haven't checked all, but. Uh, at least two or three st students uh, I encountered with. This was my first time using power-ups in a class and overall it was a pleasant experience. Are you planning on adding more options to the power-ups? So more options and the other students suggest me uh, that how about our own hashtags? Not just Bloom's, not Bloom's taxonomy from ground up approach. Ground up approach, how about our own hashtags my so students wanted to do the same thing they wanted oh, to create their own power-ups as well i love that yeah i guess uh, yeah i guess uh, it's still they they need more agency so which is which is wonderful and they are i guess after taking this approach they internalize and right now they are challenging professors by giving uh, more options by saying professor i like this approach but how about this so I, I really love this uh, power dynamics as well. Okay, so with our last few minutes, I was glad that Travis already asked some of these questions about discussion boards. I would, I'd be interested to know if you can throw in the chat, how are your, it seems like maybe a lot of people are using discussion boards. I wonder how they're going. Um, and I was so glad that Elizabeth mentioned um, this idea that we might have these ideas about what our discussion boards are doing, like providing a sense of community and reflection. And I think there's a lot, we might all go into discussions thinking that as instructors and not necessarily feel like that's what's happening on the other side, right? And so um, Meme gave a great example of his success story. And I would just, 
I'm just going to take one second to give a not success story of um, as an instructor. This is this was my go to. This was like, OK, I don't know what else I'm going to write in my discussion board. I don't necessarily have an idea for what I want them to talk about. So reflect, right? Um, somebody mentioned this, like as long as they're reflecting, it's fine. And aside from students' responses, as you can see here, which I think we might have encountered as well, this like, eh, like it wasn't really great. I felt forced to do it. It felt kind of like busy work. I also noticed on my end that I stopped reading the discussion boards as in like, they were not even engaging on my end um, for me to go in and check on students. Um, and so I'm, as, Travis and Mehmet kind of addressed what it's like on the student side. I'm just going to talk briefly about um, on an instructor side what hashtag or what digital power ups can help instructors with. And so I'm going to be using um, this book by Bell Hooks, Teaching to Transgress Education as the Practice of Freedom. Um, and she is, if you're familiar with Pablo Freire, she identifies as one of her his students. So there's a lot of connections between Freire and pedagogy and what um, Bell Hooks talks about, although she does bring in some more um, explicit discussions of race and gender um, into hers. So one of the, I love this quote, she writes, to emphasize that the pleasure of teaching is an act of resistance, countering the overwhelming boredom, uninterest, and apathy that so often characterize the way professors and students feel about teaching and learning about the classroom experience. And so for me, I, as I showed now my miserable failure stories about online discussions, power-ups for me are a way to think about, make me, force me to think more intentionally about what I want the objectives, what I want students doing in the discussion boards and force me to think critically about my own questions, right? So as I go forming the power-ups, I'm trying to think, with this Bloom's taxonomy, right? I don't want them just regurgitating information. I want to give them options. And so um, just to add kind of that instructor perspective of how this can help instructors facilitate more creativity in our instruction, which can be also an act of resistance. Um, and then as both Travis and Mehmet have, um, have mentioned, this idea of valuing and intentionally including diversity in, and Bell Hooks calls it multiculturalism, um, but this idea that students have options in what they're going to do. Um, and, and here Bell Hooks writes, the unwillingness to approach teaching from a standpoint that includes awareness of race, sex, and class is often rooted in a fear that classrooms will be uncontrollable. And so especially in a current um, historical moment with, with movement, social movements, Black Lives Matter, um, there's a lot going on, a lot of talk about how to make the academy less racist or explicitly anti-racist. And I think that these using innovative approaches to um, online discussion boards and giving students more agency is one of these ways that we move towards um, these conversations that can be difficult. As Mehmet described, he used this uh, method as a way to talk about really difficult um, about talk, to talk about different cult topics and to let the students guide their own learning on those topics. Um, and so I, that's kind of as Matt said, the pitch that, that these are a way for us to try something new and to allow student voice um, to come through and make our, our classrooms more um, inclusive to different ways of knowing and different ways of expressing our knowledge. So not just does the student, can the student write out a 150 word block that succinctly describes what the reading was about, but giving them options um, to do things in the way that's most comfortable for them. And so with that kind of final thought of how do we wanna shape the future of online discussion boards? Can we move away as Travis said from this idea that we're trying to recreate a classroom environment and accept that online discussion boards are really something else. They're not just um, an imitation of what we're doing in classrooms. And I think that digital power-ups is one method that can be really useful in, in reframing those ideas. So I think we're almost at time. I wonder if folks, I can't see the chat because I'm sharing my screen, if there's any other questions that folks have before we wrap up. Yeah, uh, 
Anton asked if we have the students respond to peers using the, the power ups. And so I, I do ask them to use one to two power ups in their response to their peers. Um, and for my students, I know that that has really that has really helped in getting them to think about how they're engaging with each other rather than just saying, yes, I agree, or that's a great idea, right? Erin's um, used this in her class too. Did you wanna comment on that? Yeah, I usually get asked um, how it works uh, with undergrad or grads. We've used them on so many different types of classes. When Travis started, he had about 13 people in, in a grad course. And I used it on a course that mixed grads and undergrads in the ITLS department. And it was actually majority undergrads um, who were getting their multimedia minor uh, in ITLS. But anyway, um, the combination I, I loved. The discussion, the level of discussion between undergrads and grads. And I fully went in there expecting questions, a lot of questions, but they really just took it and ran with it. And I was really um, pleased. And Travis was there the first time I, I got in there and read one of the discussions and I was completely psyched about it. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna also drop, please feel free to ask more questions. Um, I'm gonna drop some more resources or a link to some resources in the chat here for you that provide some additional info and a guide to digital power-ups. Susie, did you say you're using it in your class too, this approach? Hang on, sorry, I was busy copying and pasting there. I don't use it yet, but I'm really excited. I do an online um, undergraduate course that's like between 100 and 150 students each semester. And I'm thinking, you know, this is another nice way to maybe invite them further into a discussion. I'm really excited about using this. This is new to me, so I'm very happy about it. Graduate students seem to do well. You know, I give them a lot of choice and whatever you want to respond to. But anyway, I think it's be cool. I'm excited about it. Travis, do you guys recommend with um, a, a high enrollment course to break the students out into groups? Um, yeah, it de it depends on the course. Um, with the courses I've taught. Um, they're fairly small. The last one I taught was about 30 students and I decided to keep them all in the same discussion rather than breaking them out. Um, and that still worked well. Um, generally speaking, I like to tr keep the groups smaller, um, closer to 10 or so, but I've, I've done it both ways. Travis, this is Kristen from Salt Lake Community College. I just had a question on uh... Do you have to spend a lot of time defining what those Bloom's words mean and explaining those to students? I, I can imagine that, um, I mean, obviously at the community college, we're dealing with freshmen and sophomores and those terms will be, or could be quite new to most of them. That's a great question. I, I'm gonna respond and then I'll, I'll let Mehmet respond as well because he's in a different discipline. Um, in the classes that I've used this with, it's in, with in-service K-12 teachers. And so they are very familiar with, with Bloom's taxonomy. And so we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about that. What I do say in the kind of the expectations is that we are looking at trying to engage in different levels. And so I'm encouraging them to use uh, not just the same ones over and over. Um, and so I, I do tell them, like, part of the point of this is to get a variety of responses and to get you to think at different levels throughout the semester. So, um, again, I don't, I mean, coming from the, the literature and online discussions, one of the inadequacies is that students tend to stay in those lower levels, which is why, with, why we use the, the digital power-ups to push them into those higher levels. But we don't spend it, at least I didn't spend a ton of time um, diving into what that meant. 
I had been teaching, I have been teaching this for undergraduate students with this method. And maybe first, first and second week, they had some, uh, you know, problem. The problem is this, they used to, they used to have a different approach. So they try to understand new approach in this class. So maybe that's, that's the main um, uh, integration uh, problem. But uh, overall, if you are teaching uh, online, maybe Maybe it would be better to record yourself for like a three to uh, two to three minutes to explain what it is and how uh, uh, how you are uh, doing this and and also you know, those hashtags uh, let's say understand there's an explain explanation next to understand analyze the hashtag there's an explanation of the analyze like uh, what to expect and also uh, let me tell you this uh, I. I, I, I find out lots of poems about the, the specific chapters like gender, environmental justice issues. They wrote, they wrote really great and creative poem to, to, share, um, to, share, to share with me and with all of the students. And last point. Um, so Brad Gustafson, who originally uh, shared this where I learned it from, uh, the original implementation of this was with uh, elementary age students. And so I, I do get some people worried that, you know, the Bloom's taxonomy might be difficult for undergrads or things like that. But I, if elementary students can handle it, I think our undergrads can handle it. <laughs> hey, I would love to continue these conversations. Um, so please feel free to, to post questions or messages on the Mighty Networks app, and we can continue to, to have these conversations asynchronously. Bonus points if you use a power up. <laughs> Thank you, Travis, Sam, and Mehmet for your wonderful presentation. Um, I'm gonna drop a link to a feedback survey in the uh, chat if everyone would fill that out and then move on to your next session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.